some of the slides, there's uh, some detail on the slides, but I suspect some of you at the back might have difficulty reading. Um, so it's up to you whether you want to come forward or uh, uh, come see me. I'm here for the next couple of days, so feel free to come up to me and have discussions about anything I'm talking about today. And uh, by the way, I'll throw myself into the mix for people who uh, are volunteering to give you information about Agile Basics if Agile is new to you. So on, on that topic, um, this talk isn't an intro to Agile talk. You know, why Agile? Agile is not new, right? Agile has been around since 2011. Um, and before 2011, we just didn't call it Agile at the time. So what I'm going to be talking to, about today is not basics. It's about taking Agile to the next level. Uh, so both uh, my co-author of the book, uh, Discipline Agile Delivery, uh, Scott Amber and myself, uh, have been working in this area for, for literally decades. And in 2012, we came up with a book on Discipline Agile Delivery. Uh, while Scott was the chief methodologist of Agile worldwide at IBM, and I was running a consulting practice. And, and together, during his time at IBM, we wrote the book. And uh, subsequently, he left IBM, and he and I got together, and we, uh, pretty, uh, we started the company, Scott Amber & Associates. So we now run now a <coughs> consulting firm, uh, teaching about DAD, all aspects worth the, about Agile, and both of us travel significantly around the world. Uh, but you know what? This is my first time to India. Uh, three days ago, landed here. Uh, so I'm thrilled to finally make it uh, to India. Very happy to be here. All right. Um, and that's a long way away. I'm not sure if you know where that is. <laughs> so I'm not going to make any assumptions. It's you know it's a, it's in the western side of, of, of Canada, just on the east side of the Rocky Mountains, which flow north south through the country. Um, so I'm about an hour from the from the mountains. You can see the mountains from where I live. This is the city, and as you can see, it's very beautiful. This is a, a scene in the winter. Um, but trust me, it's not like this all year round. The, the most common mis misconception about Canada is that it's always cold. It is not. In fact, in July, the average temperature is 23 degrees. And some days we'll actually get up into the high 30s. Some parts of Canada get into the 40s, by the way, in the, more in the middle part of the country. So it's not as cold as you might think. Uh, also, in Cal what's Calgary known for? Uh, of course, you play hockey, but we're also primarily known for uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, rodeos in the world. It's called the Calgary Stampede, and uh, they're, they like to call themselves the greatest outdoor show on earth. So uh, a lot of people come all over, from all over the world to have a, a week of fun. Everybody dresses up like cowboys, they've got cowboy hats, and, and uh, cowboy boots, and all that kind of stuff. All right, so disciplined agile delivery. Uh, what we're finding is a lot of companies that have adopted Agile and we've been using it for a number of years are actually struggling. And if I take my own career back five, five to ten years ago, I would be going into organizations, helping them move from traditional waterfall methods to Agile, getting them started with Scrum, getting them started with extreme programming and other methods. But you know, more of our business now, nowadays, isn't that. It's actually taking people who have been doing Scrum and helping them fix things. Because they you know, become certified Scrum Masters, they've tried to implement Scrum, and they're not getting the results they expected. Management is questioning whether Agile is even effective. And you know what, it's sadly, uh, I've gone into some organizations where this chief executive has said to me, you help us fix this or we are going back to waterfall, which is a very, very sad statement to be. So <coughs> there, there are real reasons, we know. We, 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 you know, Scott and I have been doing this for a long time. We can go into an organization and we can see patterns of failure very, very quickly. And it's very easy, easy to fix. Uh, but what, and, and it, to, to make it even more, more uh, challenging is that people are taking, um, they've, maybe they've been doing Scrum for a while and they're kind of doing it, but kind of not. Kind of effective, but kind of not. And now they want to scale up. Well, if you have a shaky foundation of, of fundamentals, trying to do more of it, larger scale, is absolutely doomed to failure. So what that is about is helping you with solidifying the fundamentals so that if you want to start to do it on a larger scale, you're less likely to fail. Right. Well, that, so the point, point of this slide is that that is not something new. It's not something on the peripheral, peripheral. It's not marginalized. It is becoming mainstream. And as you can see here, there are some very big companies. And I apologize, these aren't Indian companies, but uh, I know Barclays, Barclays is, a, is a company that has a presence here. Uh, primarily, you 
see, but there are companies here from South Africa, the United States, the UK, Canada, all over the world, people are adopting DAD. Now, why is that? Because it just makes sense. This is not a new method. It builds on the foundation that we already have in place. It builds on Scrum. It builds on extreme programming. Some work that Scott Amber has done on agile modeling and agile data. Some of the good fundamentals from the unified process are it's built into a cohesive whole. It's called that. So the companies that you see here, you know, you take any large company and they're going to be doing a bit of everything, right? So, but what you see here, most of these companies are standardizing on data across the entire company. Companies with tens of thousands of IT people are standardizing on the DAD framework. That just shows you it's really picking up steam, uh, which we're very, very happy about. And when, hopefully when I go through some of the uh, principles of it, of it, you'll understand why it just frankly makes sense. So we're going to talk about, you know, most of the, the conferences that you go to over the last number of years have been very focused on improving the performance at the team level, right? A group, a group of people, nine or less, in a room, working together using Scrum and other agile methods. Unfortunately, there hasn't been enough emphasis on how does that work across the entire IT department? How does that work across the entire IT enterprise? And you know, no, no I, uh, IT software team works in isolation. You have to work with other groups, certainly in any organization of any size. You have to work with governance bodies. You have to work with data groups, architecture groups. And unfortunately, our industry is remarkably silent on that. That is not. We make it very explicit ways in which the software teams should work with other software teams, as well as these other stakeholders. <coughs> so we're going to take a look at how do, how do we make an agile enterprise? Like I said, we've, we've, spent, we've spent a lot of time on making agile teams, but how do we make the, the enterprise itself agile? Um, so that we, we have this, this uh, slice of pie here that explains that you need a solid foundation, and certainly, there's nothing wrong with Scrum, there's nothing wrong with these other methods, but our message is that they're not enough. Now, if, if, if you take me, mainstream agile methods, they're very much focused on the build and test part. They don't talk about what happens prior to something called Sprint 1. They don't talk about the planning or any requirements uh, that you might need to do before you actually start writing code. And they also don't talk about what happens after you ship it. You know, we just heard, heard talk about shippable increments of software, which is an amazing thing. But how does it get into production, and how do you maintain it once it is in production? So that's not talked about. It, it is, um, mainstream methods talk about the building part, the construction part. Uh, mainstream methods also talk about prioritizing the work by value, which is a very solid principle. If I'm going to build working software every couple of weeks, let's build the stuff that provides the har highest R return on investment ROI. Why it just makes sense, so I can get read the return quicker. But what that does is ignore some of the tricky, the, 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 uh, the harder technical aspects of your software. If you just prioritize everything by value, sooner or later you're going to run into things that are technically difficult. And <coughs> what we say is you should try and figure that out early in the project rather than uh, later on. Um, Self-organizing is good. It's a great idea that the team should be able to improve the process. But you know what? Sometimes in large organizations, it does make sense to have some consistency across teams. So you want to be able to allow them to self-organize and self-improve, but within appropriate constraints within the organization. Um, and, and mainstream methods are prescriptive. Some, some, people, some people say to me, what are you talking about, Mark? Uh, methods are, Scrum is a prescriptive. Actually, it is. But Scrum says you need to have a daily Scrum, a daily meeting, no more than 15 minutes. Um, so there's many aspects of, of these methods that are prescriptive, but that's not to say that's a bad thing. Those are, pres prescriptive can be good, right? But overly prescriptive is not good. And mainstream agile methods, as I mentioned, are really very much focused on individual teams. Now, so where, where Dad comes in and says, those are great fundamentals. We love that. But rather than just focusing on, constru focusing on construction, let's focus on the entire life cycle, the entire delivery life cycle. Let's include mitigating risks as part of our prioritization method inside our projects. Let's do self-organization but within self-appropriate governance. Rather than being prescriptive, let's focus on the goals we're trying to achieve and adapt our process accordingly. And think outside the project team. Think about the enterprise. Now, what we say is 
we call we talk about data as being the foundation for scaling. If you have this slice in place, you're likely to be more successful when you take on scaling frameworks, such as the scaled agile framework. I just uh, just to ask you folks, um, how many people have heard of this thing called SAFE? Okay, good to know. About a little bit more than half half the crowd. Um, in my world, when, I, when I, I work with a lot of large companies, uh, everybody's always asking me, how does DAD compare to SAFE, which is another way of scaling Agile up into large initiatives. So I'm going to just got about three slides at the end of this presentation, and hopefully I'll make that uh, a third of um, so, so the point is, if, if you adopt some of the things I'm about to talk about, you'll be more likely to be successful with some of the challenges you find at scale, such as large teams, geographically distributed teams, compliance, et cetera, okay? scaling challenges. Now, another way of looking at this is we want to improve as individuals. Individuals must, be, must become a truly agile practitioner within the evolving context of the situation they face. They require training, education, and coaching, and that's one of the reasons why you're here. The teams will self-organize their work strategy, their structure, their collaboration patterns to reflect the context of the situation they find themselves in. IT departments, and this is where there's a kind of a vacuum in terms of guidance of how these teams can work well together. So IT depart departments are often sophisticated entities with teams addressing a wide range of situations and a wide range of goals. Agile delivery teams are just part of the overall mix, right? You need to think about operations teams, architecture teams, portfolio management teams, and more. IT organizations will need to adopt a wide range of strategies that reflect the challenges they face. And then, at the larger scale, <coughs> think about the organization and become agile enterprises. A lot of the work that I do is not, uh, well, not, I do agile coaching with teams, but predominantly what I do is work with, as, with enterprise agile transformations. Because if, uh, what we find is a lot of times you get some great agile teams, but there's a mis mismatch between the way they work and the way they're governed by the organization, the way funding flows to projects. Uh, I, I, was, I ran a, a work workshop here yesterday and I talked about how uh, many, if not most organizations, fund projects via projects. Like they fund initiatives via projects, right? They allocate funding, they form a team, they execute, and then they disband the team and do something different. And this is a fundamentally flawed way of doing business. If you think about it, the cost of striking a team of strangers and getting them to figure out how to effectively work together and improving via the process of retrospectives, that's a great idea. But just when they're a highly tuned, high effect, highly effective team, the project ends and you disband the team. Tremendously flawed pro uh, process. A better approach is to bring work to the team, keep the team together. Right? and keep them t together over time and, and take advantage of the team that has really improved. So part of my, that's just a, one example of the kinds of changes that you need to make in, in an organization uh, is to move from a project mentality to a product or release mentality. And there are many other uh, things you need to do. You need to improve the governance models. You need to improve HR uh, incentive policies and compensation schemes. Uh, and that's the kind of work we do in agile transformations. So you need to worry about that level. I'm going to focus today on the IT department level, okay, and, and some of the, the value add that data brings. So let's let's talk about the agile IT department. And this this paradigm of plan, build, run has been around for a long, long time. They're, they're just really decades. And yes. What do you mean when you say IT department? Are you talking about the uh, people who in IT department over here will mean? Uh, people who are supporting the computer problems, the networking problem, and not really about developing the product. Do you yes, mean the, that? the question was for those at the back, uh, what do I mean by IT department? And, which I'm about to explain. Uh, but I, it is talking about not just the development teams that produce the software, but uh, the people who plan the work, allocate the money to the work, they uh, support the software in production. And the groups I talked about before, architecture, data, governance, the larger IT organization, not just delivery teams. Does that help? And we'll go through some of that right away. All right, so um, you know, the planning is guiding the, uh, the organization in IT related matters. Uh, building is teams provide a consumable solution on a regular basis. And running is operating and supporting the IT ecosystem. 
Now, when we look at where IT departments spend their dollars, it's actually not extremely efficient, not extremely innovative in a classic organization. As you can see, they, they spend 5 to 10% on planning, 35% uh, on building, and 40 to 50%, uh, sorry, back to slide. They, they spend 5 to 10% on planning, 15 to 25 on building, and 65 to 80 on just keeping the stuff running. That's a large proportion of your IT budget, isn't it? So which doesn't really allow for a lot of innovation. So we would like to move to where it's more like 35 to 50% build and less on running. Okay? And one of the ways to get there is through this movement called DevOps, which I'll talk a little bit about. Okay. Now in the planning area, you can break it down into things we call process blades. Now some of the things I'm talking about today are new aspects of DAV. Yes, sir? Uh, Um, no, many, many reasons is, is uh, there's a lot of technical debt, a lot of uh, bureaucracy uh, around getting the stuff into production. As an example, uh, mechanisms such as ITIL, but there's uh, a lot of legacy, right, frankly, and a lot of debt and, and cost of running systems. Right? And, and, and the handoffs, by the way, between the people who build the system and the people who support it. Another source of huge inefficiency is if you have a team that builds the software and then they hand it off to another group to maintain. Now I understand that's a reality in many of our worlds, right? We have maintenance support groups that maintain software and they are separated from the people who actually build it. But I can tell you the trend and what DevOps is all about is that if you build it, you run it. You may have heard that saying. And that reduces a lot of the inefficiencies. Because if I'm gonna build something and hand it off to you to maintain, because you weren't there when I built it, some bad things can happen. I can not pay attention to writing good quality code because when I'm done, I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, whereas if I had to support it, maybe I'd be a bit, bit more careful about writing better code. And also, because I'm handing it over to people who weren't there to build it, that requires that I increase the level of documentation to support the system, right? But if I'm there, I wrote it, chances are I don't need to write down a lot of the details about how to support it. It's much more efficient. So DevOps is a model that can reduce that cost. Yeah. So uh, I said, uh, if we spend more energy on on supporting the execution of the product, then how are we going to be building more products? And that's precisely my point, sir. Is that what I'm going to be talking about is how can we move the budget forward more into the build side of things so we can invest our money more on innovation rather than support. So that's where I'm going with this. Okay. Actually, that's not what I need at all. I need something a little bit different. 
So we try to defer that stuff until later on in the life cycle. Oh, it's just one phase. My understanding. So what we are seeing is planning is not just a project phase. But what I, what my question is coming from, is planning is also from overall organization per se. Because the, the stakeholders are like the seeds and the people who are driving the complete idea of having the agile in the organization. I mean, that, that also has some uh, impact and more time to be invested at the Yes. But I think that, that doesn't come under the segment that we are talking in this slide. No, I'm about to get into what compromises build, and maybe that'll become a little bit more clear. Okay. Uh, so if you start to decompose the plan, the build, and the run, um, you see these things we call process blades. And what I was saying is that uh, the book was written uh, three years ago, and we're coming up with some new guidance to be called DAD 2.0 that moves, uh, scales up from the team guidance to more of the uh, program portfolio guidance. So you're going to see a, a lot more information behind areas such as people management, uh, portfolio management, program management, enterprise architecture, and reuse engineering coming. In the build side of things, now here in the build, what you're going to see is, and, and, it, and by the way, this is already well defined uh, by DAD, is different life cycles continuous delivery life cycle, where you build a bit, this is the Amazon model we just heard about, build a bit, put it into production, build a bit, put it into production. It's the most advanced life cycle. But we also have something called an exploratory or lean startup life cycle, where you might have an iPhone app, and you're not really sure if there's really a market for it. So I'll build a little feature, I'll give it to, to, to the public, and find out whether they're truly using it. If they are, I'll do more of it. If not, I'll stop doing it. So it's based on Eric Reese's Lean Startup model. And believe it or not, even in very large organizations, they like to use this life cycle in some aspects of their organization. The Lean Kanban approach, right, where I'm not limited by uh, sprints or iterations that Scrum has. I just, it, it's a cool system, Kanban. And then the basic Agile Scrum life cycle, which is where most organizations start. And then, but, but our reality, what we need to understand is that even if we're going to do these different agile life cycles, we're still going to need to support projects that use a traditional method. In any large organization, they're still going to have uh, projects that use traditional waterfall. So we need to understand how to work with those. And also we need to understand what is the process of releasing software to the customer and how can we streamline that, how can we use an agile approach. The key component or key point about this is that fundamental to that is a recognition that every organization of any size will require all these life cycles. And this is where we have an issue where, with other approaches and other frameworks. I don't know if you're aware, but there's a lot of, I would call them religious wars, between people who favor Scrum and people who favor Lean. And it's really unfortunate, because they have their place. There's some places where Lean is much better fit than Scrum, and vice versa. So it, it, where, for when people understand what that is, they breathe a sigh of relief, knowing that they don't have to choose, that they can use either life cycle within a common framework, within a common set of terminology. Getting into run, we need to deal with things such as operations, support, continuous improvement, and governance. Okay? Now, putting it all together, this is the agile IT department. We need, and this is what is described by Dad. What I'm going to talk, talk a little bit more about is the build part, the build the, the stuff that's talked about in the book. But first of all, unfortunately in our organization, a lot of confusion about terminology and what certain concepts mean. Like DevOps. How many people here have heard of this term DevOps? Okay, yeah, that's the hot term. <laughs> it seems like every quarter there's something new, right? And right now everybody's all excited about this idea of DevOps. But you know one of the problems is there's a lot of confusion about what exactly that means. For some people, DevOps, if you go through the things I just talked about, they say DevOps is continuous delivery, build a bit, deliver it, uh, uh, and deliver it. So con combine continuous delivery and release management, and that's DevOps. Is that all there is? Well, no. Some people say, yeah, but you've got to support it once it gets into production. So DevOps are the people include the people who support it. So you have to include operations and support. But maybe you want to, a lot of people will say, well, yeah, but DevOps includes the people who are actually building it as well. Okay, well now what you've done is you've brought in different life cycles. So DevOps is the build and the run, it's all of it. So when you read about DevOps, understand that 
there's a lot more to DevOps world than a lot, what a lot of people talk about. Okay. So we call the approach where it encompasses all of the, these aspects, we call that discipline DevOps. Now, if you want to learn more about these concepts and about DAD, yes, you can buy the book. <laughs> but you know what? You can go to disciplinedagiledelivery.com and you'll see us, the writings that Scott and I have about all these concepts. And recently, we've actually written a number of blog articles on DevOps if you want to learn more. So your DevOps strategy will reflect your organizational goals. Well, let's go, go on to another hot topic. What does Agile at scale mean? Well, if you've heard of SAFE, it's about portfolio management, program management, using Scrum at the team level, as a base, and release management. But what about the rest of the stuff? Right? Not addressed by the Scaled Agile framework. So maybe, as an example, what DAD supports is multiple life cycles, whereas SAFE does not. And we also have, um, you know, the other, the other uh, guidance in terms of the DevOps. Okay. So there's no one right answer for how to scale Agile to the IT level. All right, now let's talk about, so that's the Agile IT department. Yes, now what I'm going to talk about now is, okay, tell me more about the nuts and bolts of DAD. Okay. Yes, sir. So you have just mentioned that uh, the Agile framework doesn't support uh, multiple life cycles. Can you elaborate a bit on this? Yeah, so it, it, for those of you who are new, new to SAFE, it has a concept of you know, traditional portfolio management and allocating large initiatives to programs, decomposing a large program initiative into multiple teams that can build in parallel on what we call a common cadence and integrate periodically and deliver to the customer. It's a very good idea for building software at scale. At the team level, it relies mostly on people, it, it, it's changed, changed a little bit recently, but it relies on people using Scrum-based model, you know, operating what we call a common cadence. So every two weeks, everybody finishes their work and has sprint uh, demos, etc. But it doesn't support the other life cycles, like the exploratory startup model, um, right, where we support four the choice of four different life cycles. So I'd be happy, if you want to come by uh, after the presentation, I'd be happy to elaborate. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So the, the book's been uh, very successful, selling really well around the world. It's now being translated into Chinese and Japanese and recently into Korean. So it's really uh, resonated. As I saw this, this uh, um, diagram out on the web and it sort of caught my eye because this person is talking about, look at all the agile methods. And you know, it's really hard to learn 40 different agile methods. It's a shame, you know, our, our community is so fra fractured that as soon as somebody comes up with a new idea, they take most of what else is up there, add their idea, and call it a new method, right? And it's a real shame. I, sometimes it gives, I think, our industry a bad reputation because we can't seem to get our act together, okay? And I, if you notice on this slide, they actually put dad on the slide, which is nice. But you know what? It goes to some of the confusion around dad. Dad actually is not a methodology. That is a hybrid. It's a combination of these good ideas, right? Without being prescriptive. It puts it together into a cohesive whole and gives you some guidance on which, which aspects of these different methods might be most effective in different situations. Because the one important message about that is that there is not one silver bullet. Every organization is different and every project within the organization is different. So if you're looking for the one process, you're not going to find it. And uh, so what, the reason that data is really catching on, especially in large organizations, is because it gives them the freedom to adjust the process depending on the situation that they find themselves in. Okay. So data is a hybrid framework. It brings together the best of Scrum between programming, lean, unified process, agile modeling, agile data, and a few other methods. So data framework fully addresses the agile and lean life cycles for the build part that I just talked about. Run paradigm. Now, if you look at life cycles, uh, at the highest level, most abstract, we come up with an, an idea of concept. You can think of this as portfolio management, um, allocating money to initiatives. I then will go through a planning stage that Dad called inception. I would then build it, which is called construction, and then transition it to the customers. And even after you transition it to the customers, you're still going to need to support it in production. 
So that's the highest level view of things. Okay. Now, Dad has four life cycles. And uh, I think we're at the clock. Time to Hey? Thank you. Um, a lot of ground to cover in half an hour. So I'll, I'll talk about it at a high level. The first and most popular uh, life cycle is called the basic scrum based life cycle. So for people new to Agile, this is typically what they'll go with. If you know Scrum, this should be familiar to you. As I said, for people at the back who can't read this, <laughs> I'm sure it's too small for you to read, but uh, um, come talk to me, I'll show it to you after, after the presentation. But in the middle, basically what you're doing is Scrum. We have a phase at the beginning uh, for inception. So Scrum trivializes the work that's done before you actually start coding. They call it Sprint Zero. Actually, again, something people argue about, some people say Sprint Zero is a bad thing, don't call it that. The reality is organizations do spend some time doing some planning before they start coding. It's just a good thing to do. You, if, if, if you're gonna go and ask for half a million dollars, you're gonna have to explain to your sponsors what you're gonna do with the money. How long is it gonna take? Roughly, what am I gonna get? Uh, what are the key risks of the project? What, the, what team is gonna do it? Where? What technology are you going to use? You will have to answer those questions before they give you the money. Unfortunately, a lot of the agile world is in denial about this. Now, I don't want to say this is a good thing. I would love to start coding tomorrow, but this represents reality. Okay, so for people who are new to Agile, this is where they start. And what I'm going to show you is that, hey, if I was to adopt, the, remember I talked about going in and doing enterprise transformations and convincing management to keep teams together longer term? And what then, if you start to move towards a product and release mentality, then you don't need to go through a big planning cycle to start up a new team again, because they're already there. And you may have some outstanding requirements that you didn't get to in the previous release. So you don't need to spend a bunch of time assembling requirements. So what that means is the subsequent release, hopefully you don't need an exception, or certainly it's a lot shorter. So for people who take a quick look at that, like 30 seconds, and they see this diagram, they go, oh, this looks like rational unified process, uh, doesn't look agile at all. Well, it's a shame that they only spent 30 seconds. Because if you understand what that is, you recognize that this is a good starting point, but subsequent releases, you should reduce or even eliminate the inception phase so that you can just continue. Now the same thing goes at the back end. We have a phase for transition. For traditional organizations, they can't just, you know, we talked to, heard in the opening remarks, it's great if you can build software every two weeks and ship it. But in large organizations, that's not so easy. Because if you use something called ITIL, there's a lot of bureaucracy and paperwork involved with putting something into production. And sometimes for very good reasons, okay? So for large organizations, new to Agile, they will typically go through a number of sprints, building increments of functionality, until they can justify the cost and time required to actually get it into production. And we call that the transition phase. But as you become more modernized, and you start to get closer to that Amazon model, and you can automate your deployments, and you can cut down some of that regulation and bureaucracy required to put something into production. And by the way, if you can adopt this DevOps idea that the people who build it actually deploy it and run it, then guess what? It goes away. Transition goes away. Okay? So understand this is a good starting part. It's one of four life cycles in that, but it's a great start. If you're new to Agile, a great place to start. So the second of four life cycles, the lean life cycle, Whereas Scrum basically is like a series of two-week projects. Right? You plan the work, you build it, you have an increment of shippable software, you can do that again every two weeks. Lean, on the other hand, doesn't take that approach of planning every two weeks. It just basically grabs something that needs to be done and builds it. But in this, this life cycle, doesn't deploy it. Goes and builds some, grabs something else, builds it, tests it, doesn't deploy it. Keeps doing that, but the same idea in a large organization, you can't sometimes justify the cost of build, deploy, build, deploy, build, deploy because of the gating you have to go through to get it into production. So this says we still have this construction period, maybe it's a few weeks, a few months, until you can, you got enough functionality to justify the cost of putting it into production. You got the very same idea, you got a transition period to get it there, okay? But again, please understand that's not ideal. But in your journey to get towards the Amazon model, it's a good logical step. So you've got the lean. By the way, the lean life cycle, very good for maintenance support teams where they have difficulty planning and estimating the work. 
because how long does it take to fix a defect? How can you estimate that? Very difficult. Whereas where Scrum would expect you to estimate your work, Lean doesn't, so this is a better fit. Like, so the, the ability to have a choice of life cycles is a very liberating thing for organizations. Third life cycle is the continuous delivery. This is, this is the advanced life cycle that is the Amazon model, where I build, deliver, build, deliver, build, deliver. So this is where you want to get to, and it's admirable, and we would like you to get there as well, but we're not arrogant enough to think that you can turn a switch and go from traditional to continuous delivery in one day. So we provide a set of life cycles to help you on your journey to come closer to what the Amazon model is. Yes? Stories. They're going to ask for more information. 
And unfortunately, a lot of organizations, that means they say, I can't be agile, because my boss is asking for, I don't know, use cases. So um, the agile people at the agile conference says, that's not agile, so I guess we can't be agile. And they give up, and they just do traditional. That is such a shame. Because you can still be agile, but sometimes you need to make compromises because of the situation you find yourself in. So dad says, you know what? It's not ideal, but if you have to do things differently in architecture or testing or requirements, here are what your choices are. Ideally, user stories, but you know what? You could do lightweight use cases. You could do some mind mapping, some prototyping. There are some other ideas for you to fill in the gaps. This is what dad gives you. It gives you some choice to customize your approach. Um, so there are 22 goals, and it may look complicated, but you know it's really easy. There, there's goals for inception phase, goal for construction, for transition, and then ongoing goals throughout the project. But they're very easy. Most of them, you don't need to study a book. It will be second nature to you. Like one of the, one of the goals when you start up a project, you've got to form the team. Okay, now that's not really rocket science, but you should maybe make some decisions. Do I want the team to be co-located, working from homes? Uh, outsourcing some stuff, you need to make those decisions. And you do. A lot of times you make them implicitly. Dad just makes it explicit to say, oh, if you're going to outsource, or if you're, if you're going to offshore, maybe you want to think about going north-south rather than east-west to minimize time zone differences. Right? Interesting idea, right? So those are the kinds of options that Dad points out for you that you might not have thought of before as part of forming the team. So there's, there's goals. And in the book, the reason the book is rather thick <laughs> is because for each of those goals, there are, are tables that show, I just talked about um, tables, I talked about modeling options for requirements. So it'll say user stories, our recommended approach, <coughs> their advantages, oh, in cases where maybe you don't want to use user stories. Use cases, their advantages, the disadvantages, cases where you might want to use use cases. That's why we have tables in the book, and that's why it's effective. So for each of those goals, the options are there for you. Sometimes you won't need to look at the book. It'll be obvious. Other times, maybe you want to look up architecture ideas. Right? How can I do agile architecture? We've got some choices for you. Here's, now, when the book came out, we had the tables. And the feedback we got from people is, tables are awesome, but boy, is there a way you could visualize this? So what we did is we took, we took the goals and we visualized it into goal diagrams. Here's an example, explore initial scope. I want to decide what kinds of models do I want to do? Um, am I going to do process modeling, domain modeling? Am I going to use acceptance criteria? How am I going to organize the requirements or the stories? Is it going to be in a scrum backlog? Is it going to be in a, what they call a lean pool? Decisions you need to make. Now, what the diagram shows is that if it's a bold and italicized, those are good places to start. If you're new to Agile, maybe you want to use those techniques. And if there's an arrow beside it, it says the ones near the top are the preferred approach, the most Agile choices. Right? Now, I talked about user stories. If your boss says, I need more than user stories because I don't know if that's communicating the requirements enough, I need to supplement it. Well, we give you choices. Under category of usage models, you might do personas, use cases. Uh, under UI, you might do UI flow diagrams or prototypes. Under domains, you might do class diagrams or component diagrams. You get the idea. So these are in the book to help you supplement. Here's an example of a table. So user stories, um, the, how you'd use them, the potential advantages and potential disadvantages. Value stream maps, advantages, disadvantages. That's copied right out of the book. There's a second page. There's lots of different kinds of modeling options for you. Key point is you have choices. Right? We're the only framework out there that really doesn't get into relig religious battles because nothing's perfect. Has anybody out there heard about the fights that are out there right now about whether or not to do estimating? Oh my goodness, there's a movement called No Estimates. You know what, make some good points. But you won't find Scott and I getting into those battles. You know why? Because it's not black and white. There are some situations where you want to do estimating and sometimes where maybe it's a waste of time. It's not black and white. So dad says you have choices and what we'll lay out is advantages and disadvantages of doing estimating. Okay, so um, dad is evolving. We're being very explicit about the four life cycles, how to use them and how to do that. And we haven't provided enough guidance around the plan 
and then run it. And that's what you're seeing coming. Okay? So just a high-level overview of this is not final, but it sort of gives you an idea of what's coming in DAB 2.0. If you want to use enterprise architecture and product management with their roadmaps to feed into your portfolio management. And then when we actually start to build it, so you've got build and run, you've got a choice of four life cycles. And you might be going to have program management to allocate funds to teams to build stuff in parallel. But you know what? Those teams building things in parallel will still have a choice to use the life cycle that makes sense for them. And then you'll see guidance around release management operations, uh, agile IT governance, which you've actually already written about in the book, how to be agile in the PMO, and metrics, how to do that. Okay, so that's what's coming. So the, 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 the claim about that is that if we help you get the fundamental right, if you're, if you're going to have any hope for being successful long term, it's easy to learn Scrum. It's very easy. It's more difficult to sustain it and be successful long term without the foundation in place. Okay. Um, how many, how many minutes do I have left? Oh, good. I'm in good shape. So come down the home stretch. Um, the most <coughs> common question I get when I travel is, how does DAG compare to SAFE? I'm not sure what's happening here in India, but in North America and Europe, there's a lot of hype around the scale of the agile framework. Okay? If you're a large company and you've got a lot of developers, it's Sometimes people look at the, the choices that we have and say, I want, I don't want choices. Believe it or not, people say, I don't want choices. I want you to tell me what to do. So what SAFE has done is it's laid out a pattern for delivering software at scale. <coughs> now I want to clarify what that means. Because it's not, I'm a big company, so you know, I'm Philips or something, or a bank, I need SAFE because I'm a big company. And you know what, maybe you don't. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. So I want, to under, I want to help you understand where SAFE fits. Now, this isn't, this isn't a fight between me and Dean Leffingwell, who's the founder and thought leader behind SAFE. I'm a very good friend with Dean, okay? And we get along. We just have different approaches to this. And he actually agrees with what I'm going to tell you. I actually, the, these three slides that I'm about to do, I did in Brussels in January, and Dean was sitting in the audience. And I thought that Dean might yell at me and say, Mark, you're lying, that's not what SAFE is. <laughs> But, but he agreed, he actually came on stage after me and he said, yes, what Mark said, what Mark said. Okay, so believe me, Dean agrees with what I'm about to tell you. Um, so I'm gonna compare the two. If you haven't seen it, there is a page, a, a diagram. This is one of the secrets to SAFE's marketing success is that they can describe their methodology on one page. It's more difficult for dad, you know why? Because we have four life cycles. So it's not a sequential prescriptive, you know, start at A and end at Z. It's, we have choices, so it's difficult for us to depict it on one page. But the diagram I just showed you is we're going we're to have something that's close to what the safe diagram has, a data program. Okay, so where did safe is good fit? Many people confuse the needs of large organizations to deliver solutions in an agile manner. So a large company wants to be agile. Confuse that with we need to deliver large software initiatives. Okay, SAFE likes to talk about, by the way, this is not snap and SAFE. SAFE is awesome. That's a big part of this message. SAFE is awesome, but it has its place. And, so, and they like to talk about John Deere. Building software for tractors is massively complex. I don't know sure how much you know about this kind of stuff, but in North America, you can buy tractors that drive themselves. You can cross your arms, and the tractor will go up and down the field, right? Not only does it do that, but it's feeding information about the engine and everything that's going on in that tractor up to a satellite that's going down to hit John Deere headquarters. And if your tractor is starting to break down, they know about it at headquarters. They will send a truck to meet you at the end of the field, will stop you and say, sir, your engine's about to break down, we have the part, right? Cool, huh? These things, these, I'm not sure how much track equipment is in here, but they cost like a million dollars back home. And in Canada, mm -hmm. our harvest season is not very long. <laughs> right? We get really hot for a while, and stuff grows fast, but then it gets cold fast. So you have a very short window to get stuff off the field. You can't afford to have your tractor broken for a few days. So this technology is really saving farmers a lot of money. Anyway, as you can appreciate, very complex. And, and we're talking about one product essentially, for a tractor. 
they, and to get what they need to get done, they need to throw like 300 people at this problem. Yet they want to be agile. How do you do it? Because Scrum says teams should be less than nine people. So SAFE has come up with an idea to take that large initiative and decompose it into multiple teams and have small teams, right, building and delivering every two weeks and integrating it periodically and then shipping it. It's a pattern and we needed it. It's cool. So kudos to say we absolutely needed that. But just because you're a big company, do you have teams of one to 300 programmers working on one project? One, right? If I go into a bank, they have thousands of programmers, but they're not working on one product. They're working on mobile solutions and legacy stuff and teller software. By and large, there are more small and medium-sized teams working on different technologies, different products. So SAFE actually isn't a very good fit in many large organizations. So, so just don't confuse the two concepts, right? So SAFE provides a pattern or framework for delivering large software initiatives. We absolutely needed that. So thank you, Dean. But I'm worried about this sledgehammer that people are trying to use in all situations where it doesn't make sense. So do you, does your organization have projects of this size? Or, or do you have many small or medium-sized projects of many types across many lines of business? Does SAFE provide flexibility for different life cycles you can choose from? Does it provide guidance at team level, user stories versus use cases? No, right? It's very prescriptive about the roles you use. But again, it's, it's a good thing to understand where it's, where it's needed. So this is Dean, if you haven't had yeah, Dean Mental Health. So we've, had, we've shared many beverages and meals talking about these things together. We actually come from a common background. Both Dean and I worked for Rational Software years ago. So Dad, to summarize, Dad is a process decision framework, not a methodology, right? We help you make better process decisions, consistent with what you're probably already doing. Provides a solid foundation required for scaling, suitable for small, medium, and large teams. Provides various non-prescriptive strategies for scaling, and any organization to you can use DAD. It's that gentleman's point. It's not just for large companies. DAD is used by many small companies. Whereas SAFE is often seen as a silver bullet, can be a poor fit for many organizations. It's a good approach for large initiatives. Most organizations will need other approaches. What we're finding, like that slide that I showed you is the logo score for the large companies that are using DAD, many of them have tried SAFE and are backing away from it because they understand it's not as flexible. And, but there's lots of organizations that are using both. So you, there's a good chance you might want to use both in your organization. So in summary, DAD is not another add-on methodology. We have enough of them already. But we bring it together, right, into a cohesive bowl. It's uh, not just for scaling agile. And it's not complicated and hard to implement. If, again, if you're doing Scrum, you're on your road. You're on the way to using that. There's just maybe some bits that you want to fill in into Scrum to make it, to increase your chances of success. Process decision framework, it's advice for small, medium, large teams. It's relatively easy to implement. It's freely available, right? You don't need my permission to use that. Go to disciplineagiledelivery.com and learn about it. I'd love for you to come to a workshop. <laughs> Right? I'd love for you to buy a book. And by the way, uh, the, the book, the, all the proceeds go to charity. Uh, mine go to cystic fibrosis, children's hospital. But uh, you don't, that's not, doesn't, it's not as selfless as it sounds. You don't make a lot of money selling technology books. Right? So my parting advice, your organization is unique. You need to tailor your approach to reflect the evolving context of the situation you face. One, pro one, one process size does not fit all. One organizational strategy does not fit all, nor does one tooling strategy. So just a couple more slides, winding you down. Um, there is a certification program, and if you attend a two-day version, two-day workshop on DAD, you're automatically a white belt. You don't have to take a test. It basically signifies that you're interested enough to attend a course. Uh, if you want yellow belt, you can go directly to yellow, and you don't even have to take a course. Or, yeah, you don't have to take a course, you can, but you do need to write a test. So white is you're interested, enough to go to a course. Yellow is you have knowledge enough to pass the test. And you don't have to go to a course. And green, you have to go from yellow, you have to go to yellow before you go to green. Green says you have more knowledge and you have some agile experience. And it does not have to be that experience. It could be scrum experience or safe experience. And then black is you're actually a leader in the community and promoting dad, speaking, writing about dad. It's that black belt. Now, one more thing that Steve Jobs likes to say, okay? 
um, announcing today for the first time, uh, Scott and I have just come out with our next book on DAC. Well, the, uh, and it will be available July 1st. The feedback we got from this book is it's kind of thick. <laughs> it's 500 pages. Uh, great for practitioners, but if you're an executive and you want to, want to understand where does that fit? What is it all about? And by the way, Scrum versus continuous delivery. How does that work? I Hopefully I got across to you that it's a journey from Scrum to the Amazon model. And what we do in this book is just 100 pages. It's a short, it's almost like dad for dummies, right? It shows you the journey from Scrum to continuous delivery in your organization. Okay, so uh, check it out, it'll be available on July 1st. Totally out of time, because <laughs> I'm done. Um, if you want more information, disciplinedagiledelivery.com, lots of free information. Sign up for the blog, Scott and I write posts. You get a, a nicely formatted email every time you write about, say, DevOps or whatever. We don't give the list to anybody, there's no spam, it's, it's very painless. Um, the certification is disciplinedagileconsortium.org. There's a very active LinkedIn discussion group. We've got more than 2,400 people signed up for it. So if you want to ask a question about Dad, that's a great place to go. And there's also a YouTube channel where uh, videos of Scott and I speaking just like this are being posted uh, to that. But if you want to show your boss, send him a link to a half-hour webinar on Dad. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for the great presentation. Uh, Oh, you have a question. Uh, we can take it during the breaks. So we have a lot of time, and Mark is available uh, for full.